Our children can be dismissed at this time. I would just like to reiterate what Sean said, and, and a huge thank you to all of our volunteers for VBS, and, and a huge thank you to all the boys who brought money who spared me from getting a pie in the face on Friday night. So thank you, thank you, thank you for that. Um, I, I do have a, a, good, a, bit, uh, a, bleh, a bit of good news to share with the congregation this morning. Thursday night, I attended the Eastern Baptist Association quarterly executive meeting and we are now members of the Eastern Baptist Association uh, so more news to come on that as it comes to me uh, but already you'll see a flyer out on the bulletin board out there they they gave me uh, not usually as much information as they normally hand out but they have a, folks they have a lot of activities um, going on at the EBA um, so be on the lookout for different information and, and ministry opportunities that they have available to us as uh, members of that association. Um, but I think it's going to be good, um, good group of people, good, good churches. Not that um, New River didn't have good churches and good people, but uh, again, I think that our church more aligns with what uh, they're trying to accomplish with the Eastern Baptist Association. So more news to come on that. Um, so we are still in our series of the Baptist Faith and Message, and this is the section I said several weeks ago that I had sort of skipped over uh, and that we were going to come back to it because I felt like it would be a little more topical um, to cover these subjects, being that we had uh, communion coming up, and, and hopefully uh, shortly we should be having some more baptisms coming up. Amen for that. Um, and then another section where it covers the Lord's Day. And so uh, tonight, or tonight, today's, y'all, I got VBS brain still. <laughs> I'm tired. How about the rest of y'all? <laughs> but today's message is going to kind of seem like three mini sermons. Um, and, and I, you know, just being mindful of, of time and, and, and what we're going to partake in a little bit later. But um, again, the reason I decided to sort of condense these subjects down a little bit is uh, it hasn't been too long that I've preached on baptism and communion. Just uh, back in January and February, I covered these topics. Um, but they are always worthy subjects to, to hear and to remember uh, Jesus as he commanded his church to do these things. Again, all three of these subjects are things that have changed due to Jesus instituting his church. Uh, the first two of these being ordinances that Jesus commanded his disciples to follow which is baptism and the lord's supper or communion uh, the other being the lord's day um, which was instituted by the church to commemorate the day that jesus rose from the grave which is sunday the day that we meet to worship um, some denominations put a little more emphasis on other practices um, uh, you know we should always celebrate the lord's day every sunday Every Sunday that we meet. And we choose as a church to observe communion on a quarterly basis. And we observe and perform baptism as often as someone wishes to be baptized. Uh, the first of these that I will cover this morning is baptism. And so you will see here in the Baptist Faith and Message, it says, Christian baptism is the immersion of a believer in water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is an act of obedience symbolizing the believer's faith in a crucified, buried, and risen Savior. The believer's death to sin, the burial of the old life, and the resurrection to walk in newness of life in Christ Jesus. It is a testimony to his faith in the final resurrection of the dead. Being a church ordinance, it is a prerequisite to, pr to the privileges of church membership and to the Lord's Supper. Let us pray. Father God, we are thankful for this day that you have given us, Lord, and uh, 
we're thankful for these ordinances, Lord, a, a, an opportunity uh, again to show thanks and to show remembrance of the sacrifice that was given by your son, Lord. I am thankful that you have loved your church enough that even though we have transgressed against you greatly, Lord, you saw fit to, to, to give us a way, Lord, to be reconciled to you. And so, God, again, we are forever thankful for the love that you shared through the shed blood of your son, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray this morning. Amen. Uh, so if you remember, um, again, the VBS brain's kicking in a little bit. Either last week or the week before, we covered, uh, you know, kingdom building and, and discipleship. And so in that same verse, the same scripture that we see this order to, to make disciples, we see the exact same order to, to do baptism. And so I'll read it again. It's coming out of Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. And then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Uh, so, again, looking at the context of this example that Jesus has given us, not only are we to go and to make disciples, but we are also to baptize uh, the disciples that have been made, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And, and baptism is such a wonderful event that we observe. Uh, baptism, again, being the outward expression of an inward decision to follow Christ. Uh, the Apostle Paul puts it this way in the book of Romans. Uh, he says, <coughs> in Romans chapter 6, he says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do we not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also uh, shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was cru crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Baptism is a personal commitment ceremony that, that we show. It's our, our joining together in a faith union with Christ. Uh, in much the same way that when we get married, we have a wedding ceremony. Uh, the ceremony that shows our friends and our family and the public that uh, we have joined ourselves together with our spouse. And so when we baptize one another in Christ, again, we are joining ourselves to him. And, and even though some marriages uh, do not last forever, the faith union of baptism lasts forever. A little bit of background on where we get the act of baptism from. Um, if you'll recall the, the story of John the Baptist, uh, and John the Baptist began this practice of baptizing his uh, followers in the Jordan River, and he baptized them for remission of sins. Um, he was baptizing people to cleanse them from the sins that they had committed when they came to him in an attitude of repentance. And then we see Jesus walking in, and John referred to him that day as the spotless Lamb of God. And Jesus requests that 
John baptized him, and, and, and John was very reluctant to do so because he knew that Jesus had no sin in him that needed to be cleansed. And so he says this in Matthew 3.15, he says, But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he allowed it. And so we see this interaction of, of John baptizing in, in remission of sins and Jesus coming forward. And so we are to, to follow this example that Jesus has shown uh, when he comes. And, and it tells us that when, John, or when Jesus had been baptized, it tells us that the Spirit of God descended on him like a dove with a voice from heaven calling out, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. John had told the Pharisees prior to Jesus' arrival that he baptizes with water, but there would one day come someone who would not only baptize with fire, but with the Holy Spirit. You see, when we join Jesus in believer's baptism, we are granted a gift in the Holy Spirit. This baptism signifies that we have been washed clean of the sins that we have committed to, that we have died to sin and, and, and being raised out of the water in the same manner that Christ had been raised from the dead. <clears throat> there are some misunderstandings, though, between certain denominations about what baptism really means. Um, there are groups, um, along with ours, who practice what we call baptism by immersion, that, that word, the actual Greek word, baptizo, literally means to dunk under water. And so that's what we do. It, it's kind of in the name. You know, we're a Cedar Fork Baptist Church. It's, it's kind of written in the description. So we do full immersion of an individual when we baptize. Uh, there are some who believe that it is adequate to sprinkle or to pour water onto someone, but... Um, I don't know about you, but the Bible tells us that Jesus had to come back up out of the water, which signifies that he had been completely underwater. And so if we're going to baptize, that's the kind of baptism that I want. Um, the Catholics and Eastern Orthodox practice what they call a pedo baptism. And this being infant baptism, they believe that there is absolutely no entry into heaven without baptism so they will baptize their babies as a preemptive uh, qualifier for entry into the kingdom we practice what is called a credo baptism or believers baptism which means you must first be of age to understand the gospel message and be able to communicate that to others that you are a true believer in christ I, as i have shared with you numerous times there is no magic power uh, when it comes to baptism. Although I can tell you that your baptism day will be one of the happiest days of your life. Um, again, some denominations believe that you absolutely must be baptized in order to go to heaven. A and I will say this, that you should absolutely want to be baptized. Uh, but there has been many a deathbed confession given by those who did not have opportunity to be baptized that are certainly saved by Christ. We also see the example of the thief on the cross and when he acknowledged Jesus as the Son of God and Jesus told him, Today you will be with me in paradise. Now that man also did not have opportunity to be baptized. You don't necessarily need to be baptized to be saved, but again, you certainly should want to do so, and if given the opportunity, you should. One of the biggest blessings of my ministry was when a friend of mine made his confession for Christ and we were out on the farm and we were hot and sweaty and dirty and we'd been talking Jesus a little bit and, and he told me that he had he confessed Jesus and he desired to be baptized and so we had a little bit of a, a Philip and the eunuch moment. I, I looked over at the old fish pond and I said, well right there's water, what's to prevent you from being baptized today? He said, not a thing. I said, let's go. And so we baptized him right there in the fish pond at the farm. And so, and, and that's how it should be. It should be a want to so bad that no matter that it's 95 degrees outside, that if there is water, I'm going to get in it. 
Um, and so, but what normally happens, though, is someone will come and they will make a confession that they want to follow Christ, and, and we'll set a date in a week or two uh, for the baptism to take place. Now, now, God forbid something happens between that time and the baptism. Say someone gets in a car crash and loses their life. Say that they have uh, come down with some illness or something like that, and they never got that opportunity to be baptized. I do not believe that they are any less saved uh, because they didn't get the chance, because what was in their heart is what mattered, that they intended to and they wanted to. Christ certainly accepts that person into his kingdom. Now, if you have made confession, but you refuse to be baptized, then I will say to you that that's not a Christian. That would be exactly like me telling my wife, I love you, but I won't marry you. Well, how much love could I have for my wife if I refused to marry her? There are churches right now who have deacons who refuse to be baptized, serving in the church. And folks, I'm sorry if it sounds harsh, but I do not believe that that man is a believer. I do not believe someone who refuses baptism unless they have some sort of medical reason that they can't be baptized. I do not believe that that is a believer who refuses believer's baptism. Because this person refuses to publicly join himself to Christ. Again, with, with the, just like the marriage. How much do I love my wife if I refuse to even go down to the courthouse to sign some papers, let alone marry her in front of God and my family? And so again, an outward expression of the inward decision that we have already made. Now the inverse of that is someone who gets baptized and does not truly believe. All that person has accomplished is they got wet. I'm afraid that there are too many people today in churches that have done this very thing, that they, they got baptized to appease a member of their family or to, to show their church that they want to join the club. But the baptism means absolutely nothing if you have not made that personal decision to follow Christ. You're not saved just because you got baptized. Again, you merely got wet. Mark 16, 16 says, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. It doesn't matter if you've been baptized. If you still don't believe, you are condemned. And so that is what matters the most, what we believe and what is in our heart. The other thing about our baptism is there is only one baptism. Ephesians chapter 4 says, One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and is in you all. There is only one baptism. I will not baptize someone who has already been baptized unless, unless, their previous baptism was the sprinkling because I do believe in full immersion baptism or unless someone admits that they were baptized again under false pretenses that they ba were baptized just to appease but if you have truly made the decision for Christ you get one baptism and one baptism only again I'll go back to the marriage example Be just because me and Megan have a disagreement and we get upset with each other we don't get divorced and remarried and then we have another argument next week and we get divorced and remarried. No, we've been married the whole time. And so you get one baptism. One baptism only. You, don't, you do not need to baptize because you have decided to rededicate your life to Christ. You may backslide and you may rededicate, but your baptism is a lifetime baptism. The second thing that we will cover this morning is communion or the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a symbolic act of obedience whereby members of the church, through partaking of the bread and the fruit of the vine, memorialize the death of the Redeemer and anticipate his second coming. This is the second ordinance that Jesus gave to his disciples 
to come together for communion. Uh, and we'll, we'll read this again later on today, but in Luke 22, verses 14 through 20, he says, When the hour had come, he sat down with the twelve apostles with him. And then he said to them, With fervent desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. That night that Jesus was betrayed and arrested, again, he speaks of this fervent desire to partake in the Passover meal with his disciples. His friends, his brothers, and, and, and even his betrayer. He also told them this was the last time that he would take communion until the kingdom of heaven has come. We as Baptists partake in communion as a memorial to the death sacrifice of Jesus because his command was, do this in remembrance of me. Now, unlike our baptism, we are commanded to partake in the Lord's Supper often. There is one baptism, but until the Lord comes to get his people, we partake in the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six says, For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. We observe this ordinance until the Lord comes back. To me, communion is such a special time in a church service as we will observe later today what it means to, to, to stop and just to realize and to, and to meditate on what it is that Jesus actually did for us, what he accomplished on the cross. To, to think about how badly that must have hurt and how much agony he must have been in. And he did it for us. Again, he institutes this observance in preparation for his eventual death on the cross. His body torn apart by the many lashes and beatings that he suffered at the hands of the Roman soldiers. He knew that his blood would be poured all over Golgotha that day. We're told that when the soldier put the spear into his side that blood and water came pouring out because he had no more blood left in him. And so he poured out every single drop that he had to give each time that we take communion we need to remember this and to understand what Jesus did that day again the pain that he felt the agony of the nails in his feet and in his hands at any moment he could have told them I'm getting down from this cross I will not do this I don't have to do this any moment he could have done that but he remembered us he remembered why. He remembered who he was up there for. And so we also ought to remember him for that pain, that suffering, and dying for our sins. Now again, I will give you some, some places where we differ. The Catholics and the Lutherans uh, take the words of Jesus quite literally when he says, when he holds up the bread and says, this is my body, and when he holds up the cup and says, this is my blood, they take that literally uh, in that they believe in what we call transubstantiation, which means that once they partake of the elements, that these elements literally turn into the flesh and the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, there are other uh, denominations who believe that, uh, that Jesus somehow abides in the presence of, of the elements and that when they partake that Jesus is in them at that moment but again we as Baptists follow the words of Jesus do this in remembrance of me it is the memorial 
to his suffering and dying on the cross. I would also ask you today, before we partake of this communion, that, that you would come in a worthy manner. Paul gives instructions to the Corinthians here in chapter 11. He says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and of the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. We do not remember the Lord well if we partake in these elements in an unworthy manner. If we partake these elements while we are still sitting here holding grudges and unforgiveness. We forget the immense grudge that God held against our sin. And yet he still saw fit to send his son to die for those sins. He sent His Son so that He could forget the transgressions that we have committed. So do not partake today this communion if it is not well with your heart. But please do not leave here today unless you have left that unforgiveness. If you have not left that grudge, if you have not left that sin that you can't turn loose of, unless you have left it here at the altar today, do not bring judgment on yourself in this way. But leave it at the altar and come into a faithful communion with God. And lastly, the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day is the first day of the week. It is the Christian institution for regular observance. It commemorates the resurrection of Christ from the dead and should include exercises of worship and spiritual devotion, both public and private. Activities on the Lord's Day should be commensurate with the Christian's conscience under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. When God handed the Ten Commandments to Moses, God said to Moses, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. This comes from the fact that God created the, the entire world that we live on in six days, and on the seventh, he decided to rest and to look upon his creation. In traditional Mosaic law, the Sabbath had always been Saturday. That's where we get that name, Saturday, Sabbath day. That's where the name comes from, being the last day of the week. Hebrew tra tradition and later on the, the mission of law had turned the Sabbath into more of a stumbling block instead of an observance of rest. Uh, Jesus addresses this several times throughout the gospel. And he finally told the teachers of the law in Mark chapter 2. He says, the Sabbath was made for man and not the man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. You see, the Jews at the time had forgotten that the Sabbath was actually given as a gift. The Sabbath was a day of rest given as a gift to his people. And, and we have covered this numerous times on Wednesday nights in our Bible studies because of these interactions that Jesus had with the teachers of the law. Uh, they had laws against how far you were allowed to walk on a Sabbath day. Uh, we've all heard the old adage, uh, getting the ox out of the ditch. There were certain ways you were allowed to do that if it happened on the Sabbath. And so these rules and these laws had more come, become more about law keeping than uh, what it actually was intended to be, which was a gift from God, uh, to, to take a day to rest. And so what we need to understand and what we need to remember is that we need to build a day into our schedule as a day of rest, whatever that looks like for you. Now, 
I understand that, that there are a lot of jobs that are not Monday through Friday. If you are a nurse or a doctor or a fireman or a farmer for that matter, police officer, you do not always get to take a Saturday or a Sunday as your day of rest. So that is when, but that is when you use your conscience and when you take a day to worship God, however that looks for you. It is good for the body to rest and recharge. We were not made, we were not designed to work ourselves to death seven days a week all day long. We weren't. God did not intend for us to do that. Again, Sabbath was not about rule keeping. It was a gift to tell us to slow down and to recharge ourselves. Again, the commandments that God gave were not just so we would follow rules. It was, for, it was because it is what is best for us to help us, to keep us out of trouble. And so we need to remember that. Take a day to rest and recharge. Now, again, whatever is good for your conscience. I am one of those kind of people that I could not sit on the couch all day Sunday and just rest. I get restless. And so... My day of rest might be me tinkering in the garage a little bit. I might go and check the garden or, you know, check on my flowers around the houses or something like that. That's what's relaxing for me. But find out what is relaxing for you. Maybe your rest and relaxation is fishing or playing golf or knitting or some other activity. But make sure that your rest and your relaxation is however your conscience allows. It was credited to the Emperor Constantine that the Lord's Day and that day of rest be moved to Sunday, which is the day that we meet uh, to worship. He did this to commemorate, again, the, the rising of Jesus from the grave. And so we have decided not to end our week with rest, but to start our week with worship. And again, since I'm, as the pastor, Sunday is a kind of a work day for me. Uh, I, I do. I take a different day of the week as my rest day. But we should always remember to take a day to rest and to worship. Now, I would say you, as, as any good pastor would, is that you should worship every day. However you figure out how to do that. But worship every day to the Lord. Whatever your day is, let it be well with you and with God. Uh, and lastly, here is before we close, I want to look in Romans chapter 14. He says, one person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each of you be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord. For he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat. And give thanks to God. For none of us live to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or we die, we are the Lord's. And so with that, I would tell you that, again, not only is the Lord's Day on Sunday, but every day in your life should be the Lord's Day. And we should thank the Lord every day for the day that he has made. Amen. All right, would you stand, please? I, I would like to give an invitation again before we get ready for the communion table. Um, to give an opportunity, again, I, I, my request is that if there is anything between you